So once upon a time, there was a fisherman. And uh, this fisherman, he would, as, as the name goes, he would catch fish and sell fish for his livelihood. And that's how he would support his family. Now it so happened <coughs> that because of so much competition between so many fishermen, his business came down because all of them were going into the same ocean and getting all the fishes. And as we know, too many cooks spoil the broth. So too many fishermen got in and it spoiled his business. So he didn't know what to do. He wanted to find other avenues where he could go and, and catch the fish and sell the fish and, and make money. He was, because of uh, multiple presence of fishermen in the business, and lack of business personally for him. He was not making any money. His family was getting poverty stricken. There was nothing to eat, no money to survive on. That's when he got an idea. Now this idea was a little crooked, but he still wanted to try it because he wanted to support his family. What was this idea? He had heard that the king nearby, whose kingdom was very prominent, that king has a very, very big uh, source of water. He has a very big uh, pond in his kingdom. And that pond is filled with fishes. So this fisherman thought, if I could somehow enter this kingdom, put my fishing net, catch all these fishes, and then sell them, I could make lots of money. And I could secretly do that multiple times, so no one will spot me. This was his idea. But there was a very, very strong instruction from the king that no one should um, come for fishing in my personal pond in this kingdom. No one should come close to this pond. No one should fish here. No one should steal the fish. These fishes are my personal property. They must be protected and nourished. And there should be no harm whatsoever for their, for their existence, for their life. So this man knew that there was a strong instruction from the king. The king had given death sentence to someone who would attempt to touch those fishes because he was personally taking care of them um, as his own family. This fisherman somehow uh, thought, anyway, as a family, we are dying because of poverty. Why not I just give it a shot? If I am successful, then I come out alive and I can get those fishes and sell them and make lots of money. And if I don't come out alive, the king catches hold of me and gives me death punishment. Oh, then that's fine. Anyway, I'm dying with my family because of hunger and thirst and lack of money and poverty. So I may as well die in the hands of the king. So there's no loss for me, thought the fisherman. But how does he? So his plan was, I'll go in disguise. So what kind of disguise did he plan? He dressed himself up like a saintly sadhu, a, a saintly man. A holy man. He dressed himself up in a, in a very um, interesting attire. But at the same time, he carried his um, fisherman's net with him. Because that's how he wanted to catch the fish. So he sneaked through like a sadhu. He had put in uh, different beads around his neck and, you know, tilak and different kinds of markings on his body. And he came in like in a dhoti with no cloth on the top. He looked like a sadhu. Mm -hmm. And he entered without slippers. He entered the kingdom saying, yes, I'm a sadhu. So somehow he sneaked through the backside of the palace where the, this celebrated, this very famous royal pond was present. He went there and he threw his fishing net in and he was trying to collect some fishes. And lo and behold, what happened? He could see a cloud of dust in the air, which means there were horses galloping which means the king was approaching the kingdom. This fisherman got scared now because he entered the kingdom when the king was out. But now the king, along with his horses, is galloping his way back into the kingdom and he feared for his life. He got to know that the king is approaching the pond. So what did he do? He took that fishing net and buried it under the ground and filled it up with some mud and took some dust from the floor and 
tried to make different mud markings and you know dust markings on the on, on his body as if he was a sadhu with ashes covered all over his body and he sat there on the banks of the pond it was a total drama just to save his life he had dressed himself like a sadhu and now he hid his fishing net and his, and, and 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 all the other paraphernalia underground and with all that mud all over his body he sat there on the banks of the pond saying ram 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 he he acted as if he was a big sadhu in deep meditation in contemplative samadhi chanting the holy name so the king came and the king saw who is this person who's on the on the banks of this pond this pond belongs to me when the king came close he was amazed oh a great sadhu has come to my kingdom how blessed is my day how blessed is my life how blessed is this kingdom that a great sadhu has blessed me so the king got off the horse and offered complete obeisances at the lotus feet of this sadhu and said oh sadhu you are so great you are so merciful so compassionate that you have come to bless my kingdom the shrimad bhagavatam describes janasya krishna advimukhasya daivat adharma shila sudukhitasya anugrahaye charanti nunam bhutani bhavyani janardhanasya bhavadvida bhagavata tirtha bhuta swayam vibho tirthi kurvanti tirthani swantaste nagada prata two verses now what is the common thread between these two verses the fact that when great souls come in our life they are not coming to take anything from us they are coming to actually give us bhakti they don't want anything from us they only want to give us bhakti <laughs> when isolinas bhakti charu maharaj came here to atlanta devotees were telling me that when maharaj came and sat for prasadam so the host mata ji asked maharaj maharaj what would you like to have first you know she was thinking with respect to prasadam maharaj what would you like to have first and his holiness bhakti charu maharaj folded his palms and said can i have krishna can you give me some bhakti krishna bhakti this is all that i want devotees were amazed that even on the prasadam table maharaj was thinking only of krishna i remember this because it's the context of a sadhu coming in our life only to accept hmm, our uh, mistakes and accept our sins but in return give krishna to us and because this session is also dedicated to the uh, speedy quick healthy recovery of his holiness bhakti charu maharaj hmm, somehow this was a common thread so these two verses of the shrimad bhagavatam mention that when great souls come in our life into our house in our life they don't want anything from us they don't want to take our money bahavah guravo santi shishyas vitta paharaka sat guru durlabham devi shishyas santa paharaka lord shiva tells mother parvati there are so many gurus but they are all interested only in taking the wealth of the disciple but the pure spiritual master doesn't want the wealth he wants to take away our anxiety he wants to take away our stress he wants to take our material attachment he wants to take away our entanglement in this world and in return he wants to give krishna so this sadhu remember this king remember that when sadhus walk in our life oh they are coming only to bless us with krishna bhakti they don't want anything from us so this sadhu has come in my life he is coming to my kingdom in fact he has come close to my pond and he is sitting and chanting the holy name of ram how can i serve him the king offered obeisances and the the fisherman was literally trembling for his life because he was playing this prank this this joke of trying to sit like a sadhu and he told the king i bless you o king i don't want anything from you but i bless you may you be uh, you know materially satisfied may all the opulences and luxuries of this world come into your life may your family be very happy with you and at the same time may you find spiritual inner fulfillment when the king heard all these blessings from the sadhu he offered his obeisances and he ordered five bags of gold coins in charity to the sadhu so the sadhu accepted five bags of gold coins and he walked out but here's an interesting lesson dear devotees this is not a fictitious story this is a real life story this is a real life story 
that this fisherman, he walked out with five bags of gold coins and he sat and he thought to himself, if by acting to be a devotee and by acting to chant the holy name of Ram, by trying to act like a sadhu, if I can get five bags of gold coins, if I actually become a sadhu chanting the holy name of Ram, won't Ram maintain me? Was the question. He said, I'm trying to be a fisherman and I'm not able to maintain myself. But when I'm trying to act as if I'm a sadhu chanting the holy name, I'm getting five bags of gold coins. If I actually become a sadhu chanting the holy name of Ram, won't I become, uh, won't I be maintained by Sri Ram? How many more bags of gold coins will the Lord give me? Thinking of this, this fisherman, he renounced everything in his life and he became one of the greatest devotees of Sri Ram. He went to Ayodhya and continuously chanted the holy name of Ram. He, his name was Ram Charandas Babaji Maharaj, who lived in Ayodhya, chanting the holy name of Sri Ram and speaking Ramayan to everyone, celebrated as one of the uh, great sadhus of Ayodhya. So his story, real life story is that he was a fisherman. But by just acting to be a sadhu, chanting the holy name of Ram for five minutes, he got material prosperity. And this was the tipping point, the, the, the turning point in his life where he decided to chant the holy name of Ram continuously all his life and speak about Ram Katha and bless everyone with his association. So now here is an interesting point that this story brings us to. The point is the glories of the chanting of the holy name. By chanting Sri Ram's name, everything will be satisfied. All our desires will be fulfilled. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Prabhupada says that if to the extent we disbelieve this fact that Krishna will maintain me, if we have no faith in this fact that Krishna will maintain me if I just chant and remember him, oh, then we are an atheist, Saraswati Thakur says. Atheist is not a person who just... Uh, who does, so let's, let's put it like this. A theist is not just a person who believes that God exists. <clears throat> a theist is a person who believes that God exists. And if I live my life for him, he will maintain me. I don't have to worry anything. I don't have to lick the boot of any mere mortal in this world. But if I just depend on him and I chant his holy names and speak about him and sing about him and selflessly on the basis of genuine spiritual principles, if I live my life in simplicity and genuine spiritual substance, then Krishna will maintain me. He will give me all that I lack and he will protect all that I have. Saraswati Thakur says, <clears throat> so atheist is not just a person who doesn't believe in God. Even a person uh, could be termed as an atheist if he believes in God, but disbelieves this fact that actually if I just chant his name, will he maintain me? If he has this doubt, although he believes God exists, he is still an atheist. Saraswati Thakur explains. Our Srila Prabhupada was given sannyas by a great uh, disciple of Srila Saraswati Thakur by the name uh, Srila Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj. Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Goswami Maharaj, along with our Srila Prabhupada, uh, established the Gaudiya Vedanta Samiti. Before Srila Prabhupada came to America and established ISKCON, Prabhupada, with his senior god brother, Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj, established Gaudiya Vedanta Samiti. And it was Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj who, at Keshavji Gaudiya Mat, gave sannyas to Srila Prabhupada and gave him the name AC Bhakti Vedanta Swami Maharaj. <laughs> Our Prabhupada would always get dreams of Saraswati Thakur telling him, you take sannyas. But Prabhupada would always try to negate that dream by saying, oh, how can I leave my children? How can I leave my family? How can I do this? How can I do that? How can I take sannyas? But when finally, by the inconceivable will of providence and the flow of events in Prabhupada's life, which we are all aware of, Prabhupada came on the banks of um, the Yamuna at uh, Mathura, Vishram Ghat. And then when Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj saw our Prabhupada there, he got him by the hand to Keshavji Gaudiya Math. And there he said, our Prabhupada, Saraswati Thakur, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Prabhupada wants you to take sannyas. <laughs> our Prabhupada said, oh, but I am very scared to take sannyas. <laughs> what will happen to me? Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj said, you don't worry. Krishna will maintain you. I will give you sannyas. And that night, Saraswati Thakur came in the dream of Srila Prabhupada. And he almost turned like this in the dream and was signaling to Prabhupada. 
almost saying, please follow my path. So next morning, Prabhupada woke up and told Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj, I got this dream where Saraswati Thakur came in my dream and pointed towards me and moved his hand to say, follow my, follow my example, follow my footsteps. So which means I must take sannyas. So Prabhupada then took sannyas from Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj. So that Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj was a very, very great soul. After he gave sannyas to Prabhupada, Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj and Srila Prabhupada were sitting next to, next to each other and they were honoring Prasadam at Keshavji Gaudiya Math. So one kid came and he was offering rotis to both Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj and Srila Prabhupada and said, oh, how many rotis will you eat? How many chapatis will you eat? How much rice will you have? How much sabji will you eat? He was asking all this. So how much should I bring in like that? So then Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj, he told, yes, you bring two rotis here, three rotis here, etc. And after the kid left, Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj looked at Prabhupada and said, this kid is seeing two old men sitting and eating and honoring Prasadam. But what he's actually not seeing is the fact that the future of Nam Sankirtan movement of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is actually resting in these four hands. So Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj, he told our Prabhupada, you please go to America. Take this mission of Saraswati Thakur in your heart and you preach. So coming to the point, this Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj, one day when he was sitting in his mutt, he didn't have much money. So he heard that one senior god brother of his is coming to meet him hmm, after two days. So Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj said, oh, there is nothing in my mutt to feed him and to celebrate his arrival. We must welcome senior god brothers very nicely. We must uh, give them nice gifts. We must honor them very nicely. But I have nothing in this mutt. So how do I welcome him? So he told his disciples, you go and um, do some preaching and get some Lakshmi. So that with that, we can uh, serve the senior god brother. So they went. And after two days, they did not get much. They got very little. But interestingly, Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj had such unflinching faith in the holy name that for two days, he was just sitting and chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Devotees, believe it or not, at the end of two days of constant chanting, a crow came flying and outside the mutt dropped a bag in front of Ke Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj. A crow came in flying and dropped a bag. And Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj came and opened up the bag. It was filled with gold coins. This happened. Mm -hmm. uh, less than 100 years ago. <laughs> so by chanting the holy name, a crow came in and dropped a bag of gold coins. And Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj said, just by chanting Harinam, everything will be fulfilled. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Ananyas chintayanto maam ye jana paryu pasate tesham nitya yukta naam yoga kshemam vaham yaham. That if someone is one pointed, they don't want anything from anyone. They are just remembering Krishna and chanting and preaching about him and reading about him and selflessly serving the Vaishnavas. Srila Keshav Maharaj said, Krishna has promised in the Gita, Yoga Kshemam Bahamyaham, which means whatever you lack, I will give you. And whatever you have, I will maintain. And if I shower my supreme mercy, whatever you have, I will take it away also. Yasya aham anugrihnami hari seta bhanam shanay. If Krishna's burst of mercy comes in first, if Krishna wants to please us, he will give us what we want. But if Krishna wants to give mercy, supreme mercy, then first he will take away our wealth. Then he will take away our friends. Then he will ridicule and humiliate us in public. And then when we have no place to go, what happens? Deva Namapi Durlabham. Krishna embraces us and accepts us in his very loving uh, embrace and loving fold. Krishna wants to see that if I take away your we wealth and money, will you still be at my lotus feet? When we say, yes, Krishna, I will still be at your lotus feet. Achha. Now I will take away all your family members. I will take away all your friends. I want to see now, are you still with me? Oh, yes, Krishna, I'm still with you. Oh, now I will turn the world against you and they will all criticize you. Now I want to see, are you still with me? Krishna, yes, I'm still with you. Ah, now you're a fit candidate to get my embrace. Now, when Krishna accepts, then Krishna gives himself. And with Krishna comes everything. But most of us are not ready for any of this. We want uh, Lakshmi, but we don't want Narayan. <laughs> we want wealth, 
but we don't want a lot of wealth. <laughs> so Bhakti Pragyan Kishore Maharaj said, Yoga Chema Maham Yaham. Krishna said that he will protect what we have and uh, <clears throat> give us what we like. So just to prove this one verse, Krishna sent this crow, Keshav Maharaj said. And Srila Prabhupada, our Prabhupada also, if you see, Krishna took away his business, then took away his family, and then he had to face so much obstacle. But Prabhupada continued chanting the holy name. How did this Iskwan movement start? Just under one tree, chanting Hare Krishna. Therefore, it is the Hare Krishna explosion. And then what happened? In less than 10 years, Prabhupada became a multi-millionaire. Prabhupada came to America with $7. But in 10 years, he converted that in hundreds and thousands and millions of amount just by doing book distribution. How did Prabhupada get the wealth to build so many temples? One businessman came to Srila Prabhupada and said, Oh, Prabhupada, I am a businessman. Please tell me what is your business strategy for profit? Prabhupada said, oh, just chant Hare Krishna. So he was not very satisfied with this answer. He said, yes, that is okay. But uh, who is giving you this money? Prabhupada said, Krishna. Uh, yeah, that's correct. But uh, how, uh, how are you getting this wealth? Who, uh, you know, who is giving it to you? Prabhupada said, Krishna. So this businessman thought maybe Prabhupada, because of his old age, is not able to hear properly. So he asked the personal servant of Prabhupada. Uh, no, my question is, who is giving you this wealth? He asked the personal servant. The personal servant looked at Prabhupada, looked at the businessman and said, Krishna. <laughs> so now the businessman was completely perplexed. <laughs> he didn't know, uh, how, you know how to put, frame the question. He was thinking that maybe Prabhupada is not able to listen, but even the servant is not understanding my question. So he tried different ways to ask Prabhupada. And finally, he told Prabhupada that, uh, well, you seem to have a very nice business established, nice empire established in 10 years. Um, what is your business tip for me? Prabhupada said, I have only one business tip for you. Feel free to join my business. <laughs> so Prabhupada then later told the businessman that if you chant the holy name, and you sincerely depend on Krishna, huh? then Krishna will maintain you. You don't have to worry. So coming back to that original story, the fisherman was thinking, if five minutes I chant Hare Krishna and chant the name of Ram, the Supreme Lord is maintaining me. This is a fact. Even Jesus in the Bible says something close to this amount, uh, you know, close to this um, effect, where Jesus says something like, even the elephants in the African jungle are being maintained by God. Want a soul? Be maintained by God if he gives himself, surrenders himself 100% to Krishna. So this is the fact. We see it. You just throw a few um, um, morse, or let's say a few granules of sugar on the street or on the floor. And immediately you see ants find their way and they get the, the sugar cubes. Who tells these ants where the sugar is? You just place a bowl of water outside your house and you see birds come in. And they sift that water. Who tells these birds where the water is? Who tells these ants where the sugar cube is? Krishna feeds them. So it's, there's a saying that we cannot see a black ant on a black rock in a black well on a black night. Right? We cannot. We cannot see a black ant on a black rock in a dark well on a night sky, you know, under, on, on a no moon. We can see. But Krishna can see that black ant on a black rock in the black well on a dark night and also feed that ant. Krishna feeds everyone. So won't Krishna feed someone who is dedicating his life for propagating the holy name? This holy name of Krishna controls Krishna. All our desires will be fulfilled by chanting Harinam. But we don't have so much faith. We think, oh, just by repeating these syllables, what will happen? But just think about it. Brahma. Just by chanting, tapa, tapa, hearing this sound, he performed tapasya. He heard the two syllables, tapa, from the flute of Krishna. And Brahma got to know, tapa means tapasya, austerity. And just by performing austerity, what happened? Hmm? By performing austerity, Brahma got the knowledge of creating the whole world. So just by performing little austerity, if Brahma can get all knowledge in his heart to create the whole world. 
by chanting Krishna's holy name, won't we get all the knowledge how to make spiritual advancement? How won't Krishna share his fortune with us? Won't Krishna take care of us? We must have complete faith about this. Shraddha Shabde Vishwasa Kohe Sudrida Nishchoy Krishna Bhakti Koile Sarva Karma Krita Hoy. In Chaitanya Charitamrit, Krishna Das Kadiraj Goswami mentions what is the definition of unflinching faith? Unflinching faith means if I surrender my life to Krishna, Krishna will take complete care of me. I don't have to worry. This is faith. This is unflinching faith. But unfortunately, we don't have any faith. Even in spiritual life, we think of money. How do we think of money? Oh, I am going to um, do some kirtan. I need some remuneration. I am doing kirtan. I should do kirtan in prime slot. If you give me kirtan time in the afternoon at two o'clock during kirtan mela, my blood boils. Why? Because there's no one looking at me. Hmm? But I want it at 6.30 in the evening, 7 o'clock in the evening when it's jam-packed and everyone can hear my sweet singing. Please tell me, does this singing please Krishna? Where is the intention? Are we devotionally uh, disposed towards Krishna? We are chanting the holy name. It seems like we are uttering the syllables, but we are not calling out to Krishna. What are we chanting? We are chanting, uh, Hare dollar, Hare dollar, dollar dollar, Hare Hare. Hare rupee, Hare rupee, rupee rupee, Hare Hare. This is what we are chanting. We want to attract the opposite sex. We want to attract name and fame. We want to see how many people are watching us on Mayapu TV or Facebook Live or, you know, recording on my phone. We want to see oh, who is seeing me, who is appreciating my Murdanga playing. Who is appreciating my fingers on the harmonium? And at the end of it all, how much money am I getting? So this may appear to be Kirtan. But Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur says this is Maya Kirtan. This is not Krishna Kirtan. Because the thought process is not Samsiddhir Hari Toshana. It is not to please Krishna. It is not Hari Bhajan. Hmm? It may seem to be spiritual activity. But the heart, where is the heart? We don't have to worry about anything. Even if it is afternoon, two o'clock, if I'm chanting the holy name to please Krishna, Krishna will break the roof and give me my food, clothing and shelter. This Vishwas we must have. This Vishwas we must have. If Krishna can feed people who are having illicit sex, who are having meat eating, who are drinking alcohol, who are, having, who are eating beef, Krishna is Gopal, he's Govind, he's the protector of cows. But those who are slaughtering cows and eating them, Krishna's feeding them and maintaining them. How loving is Krishna's heart? If Krishna can maintain people who are on the path of Adharma, won't Krishna maintain someone who is sincerely calling out to him? This is something that we must ask ourselves. Krishna can always hear us. And to please Krishna is the purpose of my life. My, the purpose of my life is not to become famous. The purpose of my life is not to become wealthy. The purpose of my life is not to become knowledgeable and very educated and etc. These are, these are all supporting limbs in, on the path of my life. But the main purpose why I'm alive is to bring a smile on the beautiful moonlight, moonlight face of Sri Krishna. This is the main purpose of my existence. Everything else will come. Think about it. All the celebrities in Hollywood and Bollywood and all of these different um, uh, movies, they're all famous. They're all very famous. As soon as they step out of their house, there are, you know, cameras and photographs being clicked. And they are like the trendsetters for fashion. They have the best clothing. They have the best food. They have the biggest homes. They have the best cars. They have a lot of wealth. They have so many fan followings. Um, they, uh, you know, they are very famous as celebrities. But the question is, are they actually happy? So many of them go through bouts of depression. And they commit suicide because all of these things put together is not the answer of their life. It is not the solution to all problems. You could be very rich. You could be very, very intelligent. You could be very, very famous. You could be very good looking. You can have as many women around you. You could have the biggest palatial homes. You could have the most attractive cars. But all of this put together at all times in our life still leaves a vacuum in our heart. This is why they commit suicide. This is why they go through bouts of depression and they don't even get sleep. They have to pop in sleeping pills after making billions and billions of dollars. Even at the age of 55, when they've made so much money still to maintain the empire they're working. Think about all the sports stars. 
they are almost on the brink of their retirement, but they still don't retire because they're so attached to that wealth, so attached to that popularity and that celebrity status. They're making enough money. That's not a problem. They have so much bank balance, but so much attachment to worldly things. Still, they're not happy. I was reading one um, interview of a very uh, famous celebrity. Um, <clears throat> his name is Jim Carrey. You may have heard of him. Very uh, big, you know, celebrity, comedian. And he, he was speaking in that interview that I want every man in this world to be famous and rich. Why? So that they understand being famous and being rich is not the solution to all problems in life. But on the other hand, we see those who chant Krishna's name and those who speak about Krishna, those who serve the Vaishnavas in a very humble, menial way, and they are living their life only to give pleasure to Krishna. They may not have a triple PhD. They may not be a multi-millionaire. They may not even have palatial homes and they may not have uh, the, the association of the opposite sex. They may be Naistik brahmacharis. Mm -hmm. They may be from simple backgrounds. They may be from the village. They may be uneducated. They may not have a bank balance even. They may not have a bank account. They may not even have the, the latest, um, uh, you know, watches or the latest gadgets, so to speak. But because they're serving Krishna, you can see a smile on their face. Because that is the answer to all questions. That is the solution to all problems. To chant the holy name of Krishna. To call out to him. For his pleasure, we should ask ourselves, am I doing arati for Krishna's pleasure or am I doing it just to get done with it? Oh, I have not got my tick today on my schedule. Mangal arati, Tulsi arati. So let me do my 4237 and get out of this place. Or am I doing that because, oh, today is the day of Janmashtami and I'm going to be on the altar and everyone's going to look at me. Hmm? Or am I actually offering this? Krishna. The water content in my body, I offer it to you. Krishna, the fire content in my body, I want to offer it to you. Krishna, I want to offer the flower of my devotion at your lotus feet. Are we doing every single thing for the pleasure of Krishna? If that is our mood, that is devotion. If that is not the mood, then even if we are performing the limbs of bhakti, it, we are trying to nourish and pump our own false ego. So this must be understood. So now chanting the holy name, is the fastest, quickest, easiest, surest way to please Krishna. Think about it. When someone lovingly calls our name, we feel so happy. In, in contrast to if someone just, hey, hey, please come here. Hey, please come here. If someone just calls us like this, it's very impersonal. Very impersonal. Hmm? Sometimes there are nicknames also. Or sometimes people in some cultures, they even make noise. You know, it's, all, it's almost like very impersonal. But on the other hand, if someone very lovingly, let's say our name is, um, you know, let's say um, Haridas, for example. Our name is Haridas. So if someone lovingly calls us, Hari Prabhu, Hari Prabhu. So our heart feels very happy and we look, who's calling me? Where is that, uh, where is that inner uh, quality coming from? It is coming from Sri Krishna. When someone calls out to Krishna lovingly, Krishna really likes it. Krishna really likes it. On the other hand, if we don't call out to Krishna, it is very impersonal. I want to give you another example. Second example. When we are sleeping and if someone keeps a chit next to us, please wake up. You think we're going to wake up? We are fast asleep and someone writes a chit on a piece of paper and keeps it next to us as we are asleep. Dear sir, please wake up. You think we're going to wake up? No, we're not going to wake up because we can't see it. But on the other hand, if someone says, Amarendra, wake up, we wake up. Why? Because even when we are sleeping, sound enters our ear and we wake up. So what wakes us up from material sleep is sound. This is why we always keep an alarm, you know, on an iPhone or whatever. We keep an alarm that rings so that we wake up. Smell doesn't work. Sight doesn't work. Touch doesn't work. Taste doesn't work, but the sense of hearing, it works. So what wakes us up from material sleep is sound. Similarly, what wakes us up from spiritual sleep, ignorance in this world, is sound vibration. Just like an alarm clock wakes us up from sleep, similarly chanting the holy name wakes us up from sleeping in this material world. This is the second point. Third point. When someone is sleeping, 
you can try different ways of attracting his attention but you may or may not like you can even try to you know try to touch his body and say hey wake up please wake up he may turn over on the other side and go off to sleep but if you call out to him he will get up what does that mean vishnu is sleeping in vaikuntha and we may try different limbs of bhakti to wake him up and bring his attention to our life but it may or may not succeed but just like sound vibration wakes a sleeping person vishnu who's resting on the ocean milk ocean on the bed of anantashesh if we call out to his names he will wake up and he will give special attention in our life this is the third point fourth point if the mother has two children and the one the first one is little older let's say 6 years old and the second one is younger let's say 2 years old now the 6 year old son is pretty independent he is running around playing with his toys but the younger one the 2 year old is always saying mommy 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 i got to go to the restroom mommy mommy i'm very hungry mommy mommy i want to take a bath mommy so he's always saying mommy 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 but the older one is doing everything on his own he is bathing on his own he is playing on his own he is opening up the fridge and drinking some milk on his own so you tell me who is the mother attached to more the older one or the younger one there's no doubt it's the younger one why because the older one is pretty independent the mother loves both the kids equally but the older one doesn't want the mother he wants the toys from the mother and runs around playing on his own that represents that sadhaka who is pretty independent he does, he wants he wants things from krishna he treats krishna like the mother but he is like the independent child he is running around playing with the toys in this world and just comes to the mother i want a new toy which means oh krishna please give me a bigger house oh krishna please give me a better car but the younger one the second child is a devotee who is the devotee always calling out to the mother calling out to the names hare krishna i am hungry hare krishna i want to bathe hare krishna i have to work so because the second child is always calling out to the mother the mother is attached to the second one more similarly if someone is calling out to the names of the supreme lord continuously or as much as one can krishna who is like the supreme father and the supreme mother is naturally more attached to the person who is selflessly calling out to him think about it if the child is just saying mommy 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 but really doesn't mean it the mother's going to be in the kitchen and is going to say stop it what do you need no i don't need anything mommy 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 does the mother take that chance seriously no because he's saying through the lips but doesn't mean it in the heart but that child is saying mommy i want you please go oh, that is that sadhaka who's calling out to krishna's name with desperation the mother gives up the kitchen and runs to the child to help so therefore by chanting the holy name we attract the attention of the supreme lord but the more sincere and intense and helpless our calling is the more seriously krishna will take us <laughs> fifth and the final point shri pad ramanuja acharya says that those devotees who are trying to get the supreme lord on the power of their uh, meditation on the power of their sadhana oh i was initiated so many years ago i know so many shlokas oh i can sing so many vaishnav bhajans oh i can do so much book distribution i can give all these classes hmm? our ramanuja acharya says those are devotees who are trying to reach god on the power of their sadhana they are like baby monkeys you see when the baby monkey is connected to the mother what is the baby monkey doing the mother is not holding the baby the baby is holding the mother baby monkey is holding on to the mother monkey so when the mother monkey is jumping from one branch to another it's the duty of the baby to hold the mother and just in case if the if the grasp gets loose the baby falls which means if we try to catch krishna on the power of our sadhana and the pride of our personality if we are not very fixed up we will fall down from our position but for those who sincerely chant the holy name with sincerity Shri Pad Ramanuja Acharya says they are like a kitten calling out to the mother. The kitten does not have to do any gymnastic. The kitten just simply has to sit in one place and say, "Meow, meow, meow." That's all. The mother, the cat will come and lift up the kitten with so much affection. 
You see, that same mouth, which is death for the rat, becomes life for the kitten. Is it not? The kitten does not have to do anything. It does not have to hold to the mother. But the mother holds the kitten. When the mother cat holds the kitten, the kitten will not fall. When the baby monkey tries to hold to the mother, the baby may fall. But when the mother cat tries to hold the kitten, the kitten will not fall. Which means when we are very proud of our ability and our talent and all of our skills, we try to approach Krishna on the power of our skill and our ability, we may fall down with time. But when we are sincerely, desperately calling out to Krishna with sincerity, with genuine spiritual substance, which means when we are singing Mangal Arati, we understand what the meaning of Mangal Arati is. We read through the meaning. We internalize it. And every stanza that we are singing, we sing from our heart with gratitude to our Guru Dev. Similarly, when we are singing Tulsi Arati, we want to know what each stanza of Tulsi Arati means. And then we want to digest that in our heart and sing it with all our heart so that we mean what we say. We don't want to be like dancing parrots where we say all these mantras and all these shlokas and all of these things, but none of that is drenching our heart. We want to go heart deep where we understand the, the, the essence of what Prabhupada has given us. And every single thing that we do, we do it with absorption. We put our heart there and then we sincerely call out to Krishna. Even if we are doing deity worship, we are moving our lips and chanting the holy name. Even if we are walking down the street, we are chanting the holy name. We are moving our lips. Krishna has given us this beautiful lips and beautiful tongue. The tongue will never be taken away uh, from our mouth. <laughs> Krishna willing. It is always there in the mouth. So we can ring the tongue anytime and chant the holy name. Prabhupada would say that in my ISKCON temples, um, we have multiple bells. You see, in temples you have bells. He said, in ISKCON centers, we have multiple bells, but they're all hiding in the mouth of the devotee in the form of the tongue. So I want the bells to ring in the form of chanting the holy name. Our shastras have unequivocally explained this fact that there is no re replacement to Harinam. Nanama sadrisham jnanam, nanama sadrisham bratam. There is no knowledge equal to the holy name. There is no meditation equal to the holy name. Why there is no meditation equal to the holy name? Because as soon as you see, as soon as I say Hari Dev, for example, as soon as I say your name, what happens? Uh, immediately the parents in their mind, they get the form. Uh, they get uh, the, the, the way the boy looks. They understand his voice. They understand his character. They know how he behaves. So his form, his qualities, his pastimes, quote unquote, come just by uttering the name. So similarly, when we say Krishna, the name of Krishna is so powerful. It can bring the form, the qualities, the pastimes, the abode, the paraphernalia, the associates of Krishna just by that sound into the lotus of our consciousness. So we must invest enough time in chanting Harinam. Every morning for many hours, we should sit and chant the holy name. This is the time to give for Krishna. You can get to know a, a sadhaka on two parameters. What time he wakes up and what is the first thing that he does after waking up? Many business tycoons also wake up at three o'clock and four o'clock. But what do they do? They do some yoga. They do some pranayam. They hit the gym. They go for jogging and they continue their daily schedule. Why are they doing all that? So that they remain healthy. Why they, why they want to live healthy? Because they want to live long. Why they want to live long? To enjoy more. So they are waking up at the right time. But they are not doing the right thing. But you can understand the sadhaka by what time he wakes up on the basis of his lifestyle schedule and how many hours and he gives for chanting and what he does early in the morning. So if we prioritize Krishna's holy name in our life, Krishna will prioritize us in his life. All the Shastras have described Vede Ramayane Chaiva Purane Bharate Tatha Adav Antecha Madhyecha Hari Sarvatra Giyate the Vedas, the Puranas, the Upanishads, everything, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, in the beginning, middle and end, have mentioned this point that there is no equivalent you know, to chanting Harina. There is no sadhana equal to chanting Harina. So chanting Japa and chanting Kirtan is the heart of the Sankirtan movement. Sometimes we see we are attached only to Kirtan, but not very attached to Japa. Hmm? Then what happens is that in Kirtan, we are attached to the melodies. We are attached to the harmonium playing. We are attached to the movements of the Murdanga playing and the Kirtan because there are more people there attached 
to the kirtan, so it's easier to focus. But our test in Krishna consciousness can be seen uh, by our absorption in japa, where melodies are taken away, groups are taken away, harmonium murdanga is taken away. It's just my service to Krishna in isolation. So we can understand a person's attachment to Krishna by the person's attachment to his japa. This is the life of our Sankirtan movement. Mahaprabhu came down to give Kirtan, but he did not announce a Kirtan Acharya. He announced a Nama Acharya, that is Haridas Thakur, who didn't do much Kirtan. Haridas Thakur was chanting 300,000 names of Japa every day, and he was announced as the Nama Acharya. So, so much paramount importance is there in chanting Japa. When we chant lots of Japa, we gain so much from the holy name that now when we do Kirtan, we can share it with the world through the microphone. But when we are not chanting enough Japa, we are bankrupt in our heart. And what we are singing uh, may not do much benefit to others because it's not even done benefit to us. But when we chant enough Japa, it fills our heart with spiritual substance through the holy name. And now in a public assembly, we can share it with everyone. So whenever we have Kirtan Seva, we must make sure before our Seva that day, we chant uh, 32 rounds, for example. So that when we do our one hour of kirtan, we have enough substance to share it with the devotees. The devotees are coming there for an hour, investing their human energy. Why not do the best effort in, in seclusion so that we have enough substance to share with the world? On the other hand, uh, without doing enough kirtan, our japa will never go deep. Because it goes back and forth. Uh, japa is our personal service to Krishna. And kirtan is our public service to Krishna. Without sharing our Naam with others, Naam will never give us enough mercy so that we can go deeper in his understanding. So we must chant enough Japa to share it with others, but we must share it enough with others so that we can go deeper inside. So both are actually needed. These are the, the heartbeat. Lab Jap, Lab Jap, Lab Jap, Japa Kirtan, Japa Kirtan, Japa Kirtan. This is the heart of Mahaprabhu Sankirtan movement. And then when this is prioritized, all other limbs of bhakti find their spot uh, naturally. But the backbone of spiritual life is Harina. Of this, there is no second thought. There is no argument. There is no debate. Because this is the verdict of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This is the verdict of the six Goswamis. This is the verdict of Vyasadev. This is the verdict of Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, of all the sacrifices, I'm chanting the holy name. Um, in the Bhagavatam, Shukdev Goswami concludes by saying, those who chant the holy name and offer obeisances to Krishna, uh, they will be liberated in Kali Yuga. And in Gaura Leela, we see Mahaprabhu, he served the Vaishnavas and chanted the holy name. And then we see Srila Prabhupada carrying that same baton of Gaudiya Parampara, Gaudiya heritage, giving the holy name far and wide in his ripe old age. So Prabhupada would always say, my success story is, I kept the lotus feet of my Gurudev on my head, I kept the instructions of Krishna in my heart and I kept the holy name on my tongue. So by doing this, we can succeed even in our preaching. So these were my thoughts for this discussion. Uh, it's about 10.40 a.m. local time. So I can take uh, questions for about, uh, questions, comments, discussions for about five minutes. Hare Krishna, Marinja Prabhu. Thank you very much for your amazing, wonderful presentation and the glories of Harinam. We also like to thank all the devotees to, who would have joined us on Facebook and on Zoom. We do hope that you all, we all feel enlightening, enlightened more and more into the techniques of Harinam or the chanting of the Holy Name of the Lord. One quick question, uh, Amarindra Prabhu. Um, in the beginning, the story that you give, appropriate to, to begin with, with the fisherman, and you illustrate of course, how by just that imitation chanting of the name of Ram, that he got so much in return that his life became transformed. And a lot of part of your presentation, you also hit on the point that we need to do Harinam from our hearts in order for it to be effective for us individually and for society at large or for the world. There seems to be a little point there, a little contradiction, if you like to clarify it a little. Um, on one hand, this person, you know, he imitated, he chants, and we saw transformation. 
But on the other hand, you're saying that it wouldn't work if we remain on a certain level. So can, can you clarify that? Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Very beautiful question. Harinam will always work. Of this, there is no doubt. Krishnanam will always work. Fire will always burn. Electricity, open live wires will always electrocute. Water will always be tasty. Sun will always be bright. These are called uh, uh, Vastu Shakti, which means the potency that is inherent in these objects. Similarly, Krishna's holy name will always work. But the point is, if we don't chant with all our heart, then uh, our material desires will be fulfilled. There are three levels of chanting. There is the offended name, Nama Parad. There is Nama Bhas, where we are free from the offenses, but we are not chanting the pure name. And then there is Shuddha Nam, where there is pure devotional chanting. So if the offended name is chanted, then what we get in return is material remuneration. We will get uh, material opulence. We will get more wealth. We will get a better job. We will get all these things. And we sometimes say, oh, this is all Krishna's mercy. Yes, actually, when Krishna's mercy comes, Krishna takes it away. He doesn't give it. <laughs> but because we have chanted the holy name, it's better than not chanting. Krishna has fulfilled our material desires. But when we chant Nama Bhas, which is the second stage, uh, then Krishna um, gives us mukti. He gives us liberation from material existence, from repeated birth and death. But only when we chant the pure name will Krishna give pure love for him in our heart. So if we are looking for material opulence and material uh, aggrandizement, oh, then you can chant anyway. No problem. Absolutely no problem. The holy name will work. But if you're looking to bind Krishna in our heart with ropes of divine love, then it must be Shuddhana. It must be the pure name. So therefore, sometimes people ask, oh, what is the problem? I can smoke a cigarette, I can uh, eat meat, and I can also do kirtan. What is the problem? Well, there is no problem. Uh, when we don't follow rules and regulations, the name gets offended. And the name will give us money. The name will give us popularity. The name will give us, you know, all our inner fulfilled desi desires will be fulfilled. But you will not get prema. You will not get love of God. For that, one has to call out to Krishna sincerely, which means one has to take shelter of Sri Guru. One must serve the spiritual master, accept the favorable, reject the unfavorable, and sincerely, without criticizing, without offending anyone, practice this path of Nam Bhajan. Then one will get uplifted. So if you say, by, if you don't chant uh, sincerely, we're not going anywhere, which means, oh, we may not get love of Godhead, but all our material desires will be fulfilled. There is no problem. The name will always work. The name will always work. The name will never fail. The name will never fail. So that, that conviction we must have. Even if I'm chanting once, Krishna, that name will always remain in my account even 10 million lifetimes from now. So why shouldn't I invest enough time in chanting the holy name? Someone will say, well, how do I come to the platform of Shuddha Nam? I am at the platform of Nam Aparad, offended name. How do I rise? Well, we rise up by chanting, <laughs> just like when we fall onto the ground, we get up by holding the ground. Is it not? When we slip and we fall, we hold the ground and we get up. Similarly, when we have slipped repeatedly uh, on the path of chanting the holy name, we climb up the ladder by repeated chanting. We say, I have no taste in chanting, therefore I don't chant. Well, that means we there is more need for us to chant. Because I have no taste, I must chant more. We sometimes think when the taste will come, I will chant more. It doesn't work like that. I want to chant more so that the taste will come by Krishna's mercy. And when the taste comes, I will continue chanting more and more and more. So the way to go up is to continue chanting. If we give up chanting, then we lose all faith, lose all hope. So whatever comes on our way, we accept Krishna's mercy, but we still don't stop. We don't accept material opulence and give up Harina. Krishna may give or Krishna may take. But till the time I don't get Radha and Krishna in my life, I will continue marching. This should be the spirit of an army general in the army of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So we should continue chanting. <laughs> Thank you very much for a wonderful answer. I know you have to go, but there is one question from Radha Vallabha Prabhu in the chat. I don't know if you can spend two minutes to answer. He's saying yes, the question is that we are practicing Krishna consciousness as sincerely as we can, but we are still making arrangements for maintenance and retirement. 
it seems that we are still maintaining faith in material arrangement. Can you give us refle your reflection on this matter? Yes. Uh, the highest stage is that of uh, Srivast Thakur, where I will just perform bhakti and Krish I will <laughs> I will chant your name and you must maintain me. That is the highest stage. And there are so many examples uh, of devotees even in Grihastha life with children at that level in the past. But however, for that one must have unflinching faith. If prematurely one gives up one's occupation and says, I will just sit at home and chant the holy name and Krishna's duties to feed and maintain me, uh, that may be too premature. Therefore, we say we avoid the 3P syndrome. What is the 3P syndrome? Premature Paramahamsa principle. Premature Paramahamsa principle. Trying to act like a Paramahamsa before we have actually become a Paramahamsa. So therefore, the advice for all of us is Jnane prayasam udapasya namanta eva jivan tisan mukharita bhavadiya vartham sthane sthita shruti gatanta nuvat manobi which means we must be in the situation that Krishna has put us in either as a brahmachari or as a grihastha as a brahmana or as a shudra whatever may be our natural proclivity according to Varuna and Ashrama we must be there and very sincerely we must work in this world we must not be irresponsible examples to set bad examples in this world of irresponsibility, putting down our name and putting down Prabhupada's name. We should not do that. When we are working in this world, we should work as if everything depends on our hard work. And when we chant the holy name, we should chant as if everything depends on Krishna. So we should balance. We should be in this world, but not of this world. We must perform the dharma of the body, but still understand the boss is not paying me. It's Krishna who's paying me through the boss. And one day when the faith has become completely unflinching and completely implicit, oh, then Krishna may take away different, may change our circumstances and change and, and, and bring in different uh, positive, um, let's say, transformations in our life. Where even by uh, one pointed absorption in bhakti, Krishna will continue to maintain. But till the time that has not come in, we should not try to uh, prematurely or immaturely jump there, be in this world. We must perform um, hard work, whether as a teacher, as a businessman, as an IT professional, whatever that is, very sincerely. And uh, through that work also we can preach. We may have colleagues, we can share Krishna consciousness with them. And being in that uh, profession, if they are very responsible and we are performing very well, then if someone asks us, what is the secret for your success? We can always say, well, spiritual practice uh, helps us be successful even in this world. So you're being positive examples of ISKCOM. So we want to be like that. In that way, uh, feeding our family responsibly because we got our children in this world, right? We enjoyed sense gratification, got kids in this world, and now you can't put your hand up and say Krishna will maintain because you didn't depend on Krishna to gain, bring in those kids. <laughs> we decided to bring in those kids. Therefore, it's our duty to uh, feed them and, and make sure everything is proper so that they can hear and chant Krishna's holy names. And then uh, we should also... Um, perform bhakti side by side. They should be like two tracks where the train of life passes through. So ultimately, we remember our goal. In the Shikshashtakam, we say, Na dhanam, na janam, na sundarim, kavitam bam, jagadi, shakamaye, mama janmani, janmani, ishware, bhavata, bhakti rahai, tuki uh, My Guru Maharaj says a very beautiful thing here. Srila Guru Maharaj says that you're saying through the tongue, Na dhanam, na janam, na sundarim, that you don't want wealth. Um, you don't want following. You don't want a beautiful wife. You're saying all this. But then in the heart, you're harboring all these desires. That janam dhanam sundarim. So does that mean we give up chanting that verse of the Shikshashtakam? No. We tell Krishna at the moment, I'm wanting wealth. And this is my precarious situation. This is my deplorable, unfortunate situation. But Krishna... I am chanting this to tell myself this is the ultimate standard that I want to reach someday. I want to be free from these desires. So, so we keep our eyes in the sky, but we keep our foot on the ground. 